door in the woods where did this idea come from um for uh years and years and years i have had a reoccurring dream about a door standing alone in the woods and uh sometimes there are good things on the other side of that door sometimes there are bad things on the other side of that door but i've had that image uh for as long as i can remember i've had that dream so uh we took that idea and I sat down with a friend and we came up with a story around a, a door. And, uh, but that was the beginning of it was that, that dream image in my head forever. And what were some of the, the good things and the bad things were on the other side of the door in your dream? Um, I, <laughs> um, I dream, uh, I, I'm one of those weirdos that has super poetic dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, the uh, the bad things are unfortunately things I can't afford to put in a movie. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I often on the other side of that dream there is a uh, a blue tree that is on fire, and there is a clockwork girl with a sword that I have to fight, <laughs> and she is vicious, <laughs> and I don't know what that's about. We. I asked the therapist, and she's like, "You know, we're gonna we're, we'll get to that eventually." But that's the way. <laughs> that's the way. The way. Uh, so obviously, j- just a door in the woods is not it cannot take up like a feature length film, you know, runtime. So right. how do you how do you flesh out this idea with a surrounding story? Um, so my favorite my favorite things to write about, and my favorite things to kind of explore in art are. Uh, the lies that we tell children that um, some adults insist on believing through adulthood. Um, Things like, you know, we tell kids you can be whatever you want to be. And that's not really true. You can't, my brother wanted to grow up to be a fire truck. So that's not (laughs) something you can do. Um, But one of the lies we tell children is there are no such things as monsters. And boy, oh boy, is that not true. Um, you know, maybe not the vampires and the werewolves, but there there are monstrous things out there. And, uh, um, you know, one poor decision. This family in the movie, they're, they're you know, they're pretty smart people. Um, but she makes this one terrible decision of bringing this door home. And uh, the audience is screaming, do not take this door home. This is obviously a bad decision. But, uh, man, everybody I know, uh, every smart person I know, eventually makes one giant red flag bad decision in their life, whether it's a relationship or a uh, financial decision. There's some kind of horrible decision they make that everybody around them can see is a bad choice. So uh, that's what we wanted to explore with this story is this bad choice and ultimately the price this family pays uh, for making this terrible choice. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the movie. Uh, I watched it this morning, mm-hmm. but I want to, I'll, I'll try to get around the generalities of it as uh, okay. <laughs> it, the, there, there is a sacrifice that the, the family does have to make. And yeah. do you think that eventually in the future you'll be able to explore in another film uh, the consequences of that sacrifice? I, I'm not sure if we, if we do another film, it will probably follow our Uriah character, the, um, the spiritualist. Uh, mm-hmm. And we'll probably, we'll probably go sp- explore something else with him. Um, I, to me, it's pretty, I always felt like the next step was pretty, uh, this, this family is probably not a family in five years. Th- these people probably split up. Mm-hmm. This kid does not end up healthy. Like this, this is, they, they, ultimately get their kid and they get some sense of safety um but the damage has been done and there will be consequences for their choice and there will be consequences for the the things that have happened to them and i'm man the movie's already got an air of sadness around it and i don't think i want to explore any more sadness (laughs) (laughs) Uh, the uh the spiritual character uh araya yes where did you find the actor to play him? Because uh, to be honest, he was the best part of the film. Uh, He's great, isn't he? He, he can be so He's expressive, so uh, but not really having <laughs> to say a whole lot. <laughs> right. Um, so we knew I wrote the character as deaf, and I knew we wanted a deaf actor. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we, we uh, for sure wanted to cast a deaf actor. And it turns out there are uh, just tons of super talented deaf actors that uh, are underemployed. Man, mm-hmm. they are just not used. Mm-hmm. And I think there is something to um, sign language itself is so expressive. Uh, the things that um, most people do with just their voice, intonation and connotation, what they do with their voice, um, in order to do that with a sign language, you do that with expression. So um, uh, somebody who's really good at sign language, that's going to translate into acting uh, for them because uh, they're so used to, to um, expressing this information just with a look. And so uh, we were on a hunt. We had contacted several casting directors, and uh, um, we came across CJ, uh, who at the time was finishing up Baby Driver. Uh, he's the adoptive father in uh, Baby Driver. And I'm like, man, if uh, – and I looked at some of the other stuff he's done, and he was just perfect. Um, so we had one conversation, and we were in. Uh, CJ was so excited to do the part. I was a little hesitant because there's the trope of, you know, the magical person of color yes. um, mm-hmm. in movies. And I, I did, Uriah wasn't written as, uh, as African American. He was simply written as deaf. And CJ was just the best actor for the part. And he wanted it so bad. So that's the direction we went. Uh, so I was a little hesitant there, but I'm so glad we went ahead and did it because CJ's just terrific. Um, in fact, CJ and Jennifer both have won. Uh, we, we spent a year taking this movie to uh, film festivals, and Jennifer and CJ both won uh, acting awards for a horror thriller movie, which does not happen at film festivals. I mean, this was, CJ won at like the Nashville Film Festival. It's, it's not a genre festival, and they just don't hand out acting awards for horror and, and thriller stuff. Uh, but they both got recognized. I'm super proud of them. When you when you had to direct CJ, um, because his acting comes in three parts: you know, his voice, his expressions, but also his sign language. How do you direct yeah. someone to sign something in a particular way that gives it extra impact on screen? That's almost entirely CJ. Um, so uh, I was concerned about directing a deaf actor because, you know, on set most of your job is to run up between takes and whisper into an actor's ear. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's not a possibility. So uh, we had an interpreter on set for CJ, but after the first day, I was amazed at how easy communication was with CJ um, and how intuitively uh, he um, interacts. Um, so with CJ, uh, the first thing is when, um, some, so American Sign Language and English are not a direct translation. Right. Uh, so the grammar and vocab, everything's completely different. So when CJ is using what they call SIMCOM, which is he's signing and speaking at the same time, that's the equivalent of speaking English while you write in Spanish. It gotcha. is difficult. <laughs> so... <laughs> Those sections uh, we talked about ahead of time, and CJ was prepared, and CJ always had suggestions of uh, – uh, there's a great um, there's a great couple lines uh, toward the end when CJ is talking about this demonic entity um, expanding its ground, uh, taking over new ground. And CJ thought for a few minutes about what that sign should be and finally came up with this thing where he uses his hands to kind of grasp in front of him. And then he did this thing where um, I don't, I don't know exactly what he's doing and what makes it look this way, but all of a sudden it's, it's creepy skeleton fingers when he does it. And it just adds so much to the, you don't even have to hear the line he's saying, you know what he's mean. Even if you don't speak sign language, you understand the meaning and that's all CJ. Yeah, that's, that's when he um, was he was reaching out and clawing at the table. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was uh, uh. That, that was pretty terrifying. To you have an interpreter who's deaf interpreting a contract between you and whatever this <laughs> thing is. It's like there's so many levels of things you have to try to comprehend while you're 
right. while you're bargaining for someone's life. I can imagine just how stressful that right. would be. And it, you know, in shooting this, it's it's a, you know, we make no bones about the fact that this is a lower budget film. Mm-hmm. Um, we we had to we had to make as as you know put as much money as we could on the screen, but we're limited in money and time, and so uh, um, that the final kind of sequence uh, here, I, I don't want to get into spoiler territory, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but um, we're in a scene where uh, CJ can see and hear things in this scene that uh our our family cannot hear and see and keeping all of that straight um by and moving the camera around and trying to you know not just have over the shoulder shots trying to do a little bit of creative camera work man that gets complicated in a hurry with no money (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can, I can tell by the way some of the shots were blocked off where you just you get yeah. like a two person shot or you get three but you're just you're just chopping off the end of that table so it's yeah so you're not giving Absolutely. away that nothing's there but yeah it was right it was good work i mean it made it made the scene work with what you had you didn't necessarily I, CJ, need four characters on screen at one time right. to get the message across right. and cj sells that with, mm-hmm. with just a little bit of thought in the, our, our editor, Rob Chris did a great job making that. You know, anytime you got four people sitting around a table, it's already difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd, you'd think it'd be easy, but man, people around a table is hard. Um, <laughs> and uh, our editor, Rob did a great job. And then CJ just makes that work. You just believe it because of CJ. I, I think if you had done the, the standard thing where you have them all just standing just kind of just like halfway encircling this thing, it it would have it wouldn't have worked as well because you probably no, would have had I, to do a lot of almost all over the shoulders or just back and forth from you know front of the actor to right. the thing, and then it probably would have lost its the power that was there. I yeah so, I think so yeah I think having a table in the woods all sitting down actually works in this case. <laughs> <laughs> I I did too. I think that was our best option, but but it it took some planning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what were some of the things that you had to sacrifice with the budget you had that uh, you had in your original idea for the story? Um, we would have liked to have uh, our art department did a great job with creature effects, mm-hmm. but we we were on a budget, and uh, um, our art department had to do double duty with some special effects work. Uh, we had a great company that came in and augmented some stuff digitally for us, but we couldn't afford to do a lot of that. So, uh, um, a lot, you know, they did a lot of wire removal for some things and, um, mm-hmm. uh, some stuff like that. But our art department really had to pull double duty. Uh, our, uh, um, art director ended up getting pneumonia on, on this shoot. We <laughs> almost killed her. She just, she just really went above and beyond. But they created the creature suit. Um, they had to figure out a lot of the effects work because we just didn't have the budget to bring on a practical effects person. And we were set on doing, you know, a lot of these effects practically. Um, we didn't want, you know, there are certain things we have to do digitally, but we wanted it to be as practical uh, as we could. And so uh, we sacrificed a little bit there. And then uh, stuff, well, when we shot, so everything you see that's shot outdoors, we shot in the coldest December. We shot in Arkansas, and it was the coldest December we've had in years. Uh, fortunately, we didn't get a lot, a lot of snow and ice, but just, you know, five-degree temperatures. And that entire third act is shot in a dried-up pond. That, cl- that entire clearing is a dried-up pond that's about 20 feet lower uh, in this valley. So it is freezing. Uh, camera our red camera froze up and wouldn't even boot up uh follow froze, follow wow. focus froze solid wouldn't work so every scene you see that's outdoors just off camera there are giant propane heaters keeping actors alive <laughs> <laughs> i mean just off, in fact we digitally reframed several shots just to you know catch a get a little bit of shadow out or something because these heaters <laughs> are right on them just to stay alive and then cut if we had a you know a five minute break everybody was off to the tents where we had big heaters to keep get everybody warmed up um (laughs) 
when you had to cast the uh, the family, or mainly the parents, uh, was it an open yeah. casting call, or did you already have people in mind that you wanted to bring in for this? We had Jennifer Pierce Mathis in mind. Um, I had uh, several mutual friends with her. She lives in Oxford, Mississippi. And um, Oxford is a great film. If there are any filmmakers out there, you want to apply to the Oxford Film Festival. I'll just plug them. It is one of my favorite festivals in the United States. It's so terrific. And there's a great arts and film scene down there. And Jennifer is fantastic. She guests on TV all the time. She was uh, two nights ago. She was on Bluff City Law doing a great spot. She's terrific. So I knew we wanted her. And uh, in fact, I did a draft of the script kind of with her in mind once we knew she was interested. And then David Snell, our, the father, was a, uh, he was a regular on The Shield, uh, which is one of my favorite, favorite shows. Um, and so our producer uh, had met David and worked with him before. So we brought Dave. And that is really a thankless part um, of the father. He does such a great job. And um, he, uh, you know, especially during the seance, we're trying not to pull attention away from CJ and Jennifer and some of the things that are happen happening. So he has a little bit of a less flashy, less, uh, um, less showy role. And I think he mm -hmm. did a great job. And then our son, uh, John Michael Fisher, is local. Uh, we looked a long time for a kid, and we found him. He's, he's about 30 minutes away, and his mother is a drama teacher. And uh, he was just terrific. This was his first movie, and he did a great job. Uh, when you were shooting in that location that was, that was very cold, I didn't notice a lot of um, typical-looking day-for-night shots, you know, like just a blue filter over it, but... Did you film everything at night, or were there daytime shots we that you did have to? Manipulate? We filmed every everything at night. We had wow. we had uh, a week and a half of overnight, and uh, in fact, we lost one. Uh, we lost half a day, half a night, technically, to a generator going down. So we were scrambling, but it was all, uh, and we had to shuttle everybody in. You had to have four wheel drive to get back to where. Uh, this location was <laughs> um so we had to park everybody in a field and then shuttle them over and we put up tents and generators and heaters and brought in catering and all that stuff over uh um to our location but yeah we shot overnight for a week and a half just in freezing temperatures <laughs> uh m my last question which is uh usually the most important question is where and when will be able will people be able to see uh, your film? Jordan, it is available on DVD and video on demand right now. Um, so Amazon, iTunes, Vudu, Sling, Xbox, PlayStation, so all of those places, and uh, a lot of cable on demand as well. Um, and then DVDs are available. I don't have a list of where all DVDs are available, but I know uh, Amazon has it on DVD. Um, so, yeah, it's available everywhere right now. Uh, will you be making any convention appearances where people can get their DVD signed or anything like that? I don't. I am trying to set that up now. We movie just came out, and uh, i, I got to be honest. People are loving or hating this movie. There is nobody on the fence, man. <laughs> it's, it's all, low budget seems to always have that weird polarization <laughs> effect. Like People don't understand and, when they go into a low budget movie that you're not going right. to get – everything that you're used to with like a Disney production. <laughs> right. Right. And then there's a little bit of like, uh, if you're into a lot of the people that are liking this are not typical horror thriller fans, mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of family drama to it. There's a lot of moral, uh, um, kind of, uh, uh, there's a, a real moral trap to this kind of story. And it's very atmospheric. And the people who are looking for, you know, a slasher and heads to come off and ghosts popping out everywhere, that's not what you're going to get. It is a atmospheric slow burn with a freight train ending uh, coming from, from the very beginning. Yeah, so, you're not, uh, shuffling, yeah, you're people, not shuttling victims from one kill zone no. to another. It's... <laughs> no, no. No, it is, it is a slow, slow burn to, a, to an end, which is – I like that. I like um, – you know, not that we're on this level at all, but I love Hereditary. I love The Witch. I love all mm -hmm. of these things that are deeply atmospheric, and uh, wanted to try to make something more like that. So.
So 